before Justice Robert H. Jackson at the trial of major war German war criminals in Nuremberg. He served in, his capacity, in, his capa in this capacity throughout the trial until October 1st, 1946, and was responsible for the prosecution of Ernst Kentenbrunner, the Gestapo, and the SD. For his services at Nuremberg, he was awarded the Legion of Merit, the highest decoration received by any trial counsel. In 1954, Mr. Harris published Tyranny on Trial, the first comprehensive book on the Nuremberg trial, with a second edition published in 1995 and a third edition published in 1999. Mr. Harris was an NGO delegate to the Rome Conference for the International Criminal Court, representing the committee of former Nuremberg prosecutors, of which he was the organizer and coordinator. He stands for the view that the rule of law must displace the role of force if there is to be permanent peace in the world. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Mr. Whitney Harris. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say it's a distinct privilege uh, to present the final address to this conference sponsored uh, by the Section of International Law of the American Bar Association, of which both Henry King and I are past uh, uh, chairman, although to be sure, I, uh, I preceded him by a quarter of a century. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, Ben Perez reminded me at lunch that I'm probably the only living lawyer now uh, who is active at all who was uh, 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 participated throughout the first Nuremberg trial, the major trial, from the beginning to its end. Uh, we are here to commemorate the 60th anniversary of that great trial at the end of the Second World War and to assess the contribution of that historic event uh, to the development of international law. Far more important than the convictions or acquittals of the 22 defendants in that trial are the principles of law declared and enforced against them. Although these men are all now dead, long dead and gone, the principles by which they were judged live on and must have the respect of history if civilization is to survive. Those principles declared and applied at Nuremberg grew out of the thrust of war upon the civilized world in the 20th century. They were not edicts conceived and inscribed by monks in medieval palaces. They were rules of criminal conduct declared and applied to save humanity from the inhumanity of man. They were not conceived in theory. They were compelled by facts facts too extreme and horrible to bear repetition in the future, if there is to be a future for man upon this planet Earth. And hence, in a final statement to this conference, where legal principles have been brilliantly declared and discussed, and for which there is no need for repetition, let me speak for a few minutes about some of the incredible facts uncovered at Nuremberg, which provided the basis for those principles. On March 24, 1944, President Roosevelt declared, in one of the blackest crimes in all of history, begun by the Nazis in the days of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. It is therefore fitting that we should again proclaim our determination that none who participate in these acts of savagery shall go unpunished. As you know, the Charter of the International Military Tribunal declared three categories of crime within its jurisdiction, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Of these, the first two categories were relatively easy to prove. Hitler's acts of aggression had been open and 
obvious. They had been foretold in Mein Kampf. He had uh, described in conference with his top uh, leaders uh, his intention to seize territory in Europe by military actions. He gained his way in Austria and Czechoslovakia by a threat of force. He defeated Poland and France by the use of force and his attack on Russia uh, was blatant aggression. The defense to this count was Nullum Primum Sine Lega, and defense counsel argued this principle throughout the trial, pointing out that this was the first time in history in which the charge had been made in a criminal case. As we know, especially in light of the Brian Kellogg Treaty, the tribunal had little difficulty in deciding this count against the implicated defendants. And war crimes, including the mistreatment of prisoners of war, reprisals against partisans, the devastation of villages, uh, and the execution of hostages, which had long been recognized as cognizable in international law, gave the tribunal few problems. There were, in addition, criminal acts unique in warfare one of these was the Nacht and Naval Air Laws, the Night and Fog Decree, under which a person in occupied territory could be secretly apprehended and executed or spirited away to Germany. Keitel considered this order the worst blight on the military. Special treatment was the code name for the screening of POW camps for politically undesirable prisoners, such as communist functionaries, who were turned over to the Gestapo for execution. The Kugel air loss, or bullet decree, ordered recaptured escaped Russian officers to be sent to Mauthausen concentration camp as K prisoners, where they were killed by shooting in the back of the neck. Proving these offenses was not always easy, but once proven, uh, there was no problem of conviction under established principles of international law. But crimes against humanity were unique to the world, and proof of this charge fell largely to the American prosecution. We knew, of course, that the Nazis had established concentration camps for the incarceration without trial of political opponents, and that Hermann Goering had been responsible for establishing these camps in Prussia. And we understood that Nazis had persecuted Jews and other political opponents. But at the beginning of the trial, we had no hard evidence on the scope of these crimes or how or by whom they had been committed. Because the Nazi repressive agencies, the Gestapo and SD, were combined with the Nazi intelligence in the Reich Main Security Office, or RSHA, and I had acquired knowledge of German intelligence in OSS during the war, I was assigned to repair the case against the Gestapo and SD and the chief of the RSHA, Ernst Kaltenberg. I was provided an office in the cold and drafty Palace of Justice, a German secretary, and a second-hand typewriter and told to go to work. My task was to write briefs supported by document books providing a prima facie case against these defendants. A principal source of documentary evidence were the several hundred captured German documents which had been translated and filed in our document room. But I searched through abandoned Gestapo offices and interrogated potential witnesses in the effort to prove the criminality of these defendants. Shortly after I had been given this assignment, I found an interesting letter in the document room. It had been written by a na man named Becker to Walter Rauch, the head of the motor vehicles department of the Gestapo. In his letter, Becker complained about the malfunctioning of a gas van which he was operating in the Eastern Territory. It had been written from an Einsatz commando. At that time, I knew nothing about Einsatz commandos or the criminal activities of the Gestapo and SD on the Eastern Front. While preparing the case against Kaltenbrunner, I learned that British intelligence had taken prisoner a man by the name of Otto Ohlendorf 
and had him under interrogation in London. Ohlendorf was the head of Office 3 of the RSHA, which dealt with intelligence inside Germany. I had no idea that he might be able to shed light on war crimes, but I thought that it would be useful to bring him to Nuremberg, where I could learn more from him about this organization of which Koffenberger was the chief. The British sent him to Nuremberg, and I began the interrogation by asking him what his activities had been during the war. He said that he had served as the chief of Office 3 of the RSHA, except for the year 1941. Naturally, I asked, what did you do during that year? And he replied, in 1941, I was the chief of Einsatzgruppe D. This instantly brought recall of the Becker letter, which had been written from an Einsatz commando, and I was inspired to ask, well, Ollendorf, how many men, women, and children did your group kill that year? And he answered, 90,000. After this admission, we were able to develop how four Einsatzgruppe operated in the Eastern Territories, rounding up Jews and murdering them in anti-tank ditches or in the open fields. Ohlendorf testified at the trial and was questioned by the Soviet judge, General Nikitschenko. Question. In your testimony, you said that the Einsatzgruppe had the object of annihilating the Jews and commissars. Is that correct? Answer, yes. Question, and in what category did you consider the children? For what reason were the children massacred? Answer, the order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. Question, including children? Answer, yes. Question, were all the Jewish children murdered? Answer, yes. Any contention that these murders were carried out by subterfuge and without force was belied by the account of two such mass murders witnessed by Herman Gravy the German manager and engineer in charge of the branch office of the Solinger firm in the Ukraine from September 1941 until January 1944. Gravy's interest in the mass executions arose from the fact that in addition to Poles, Germans, and Ukrainians, he employed Jews on the various construction projects under his supervision. He described a mass execution which he witnessed on October 5, 1943, at Dubno, Ukraine. He said, I drove to the site accompanied by my foreman and saw near it great mounds of earth about 50 meters long and two meters high. Several trucks stood in front of the mound. Armed Ukrainian militia drove the people off the trucks under the supervision of an SS man. The militiamen acted as guards on the trucks and drove them in and to from the pit. All these people had the regulation yellow patches on the front and back of their clothes and thus could be recognized as Jews. My foreman and I went directly to the pits. Nobody bothered us. Now I heard rifle shots in quick succession from behind one of the earth mounds. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress upon the orders of an SS man who carried a riding or dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, top clothing and underclothing. I saw heaps of shoes of about 800 to 1,000 pairs, great piles of under linen and clothing. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other and said farewells and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit, also with a whip in his hand. During the 15 minutes that I stood nearby, I heard no complaint or plea for mercy. I watched a family of about eight persons, a man and a woman, both about 50. 
with some children of about one, eight, and ten, and two grown-up daughters of about twenty and twenty-four. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding the one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing in delight. The couple was looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about ten years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit called out to his comrade. The latter counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. Among them was the family, which I had mentioned. I well remember a girl, slim with black hair, who as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and were lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders from their heads. The pit was already two-thirds full, I estimated that it already contained about a thousand bodies. I had looked for the man who did the shooting. He was an SS man who sat at the edge of the narrow end of the pit, his feet dangling into the pit. He had a Tommy gun on his knees and was smoking a cigarette. The people went down some steps which were cut in the clay wall of the pit and clambered over those already massacred to the place to which the SS man directed them. They lay down in front of the dead or injured people. Some caressed those who were still alive and spoke to them in a low voice. Then I heard a series of shots. I looked into the pit and saw that the bodies were twitching or the heads were lying motionless on top of the bodies which lay before them. I left with my foreman and drove with my car back to Dubno. In my book, Tyranny on Trial, a diagram is displayed containing a report by Stalaker, the chief of Einsatzgruppe A, showing the number of Jews exterminated in the Baltic states, each number encased in the diagram of a coffin. The report stated that in the first months, four months of operation, this Einsatzgruppe had murdered 135,000 communists and Jews. Estonia was shown as already Judenfrei, free of Jews. An especially dramatic moment of the trial was the cross-examination of Hermann Goering by Justice Jackson. Goering had assumed the role of leader of the defendants. He occupied the first seat in the prisoner's dock. He was irritated by the apparent disinterest in the proceedings of Rudolf Hess, who sat next to him. But at every opportunity, he sought to stimulate the other defendants to challenge uh, the prosecution in every possible way. It was, therefore, of great interest to the press when Goering was brought under cross-examination by Justice Jackson. I was Jackson's assistant in this dramatic moment of the case and sat beside him at the prosecutor's podium. Among the issues we raised was Goering's role in the terrible pogrom of November 9, 1938, which has come to be known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. This was a Nazi reaction to the murder of a secretary in the German embassy in Paris by a German Jew named Grinspan. During the night, Jewish stores were destroyed in Germany. Thousands of Jews were taken into custody and sent to concentration camps. Goering met with Hitler and Goebbels to consider further repressive measures. Goering proposed imposing a fine of one billion Reichsmarks on the Jews whose property had been destroyed so that all insurance benefits to which they might be entitled would instead be paid to the state. At a meeting in the Reich Care Ministry, Goering declared that Jews should be forced out of the economy. Their property should be seized and only interest paid upon its undervaluation. We must agree on a clear action, he said, that will be profitable. 
uh, to the state. And he closed the meeting with these prophetic words. I'd like to say again that I would not like to be a Jew in Germany if in the near future the German Reich should come into conflict with foreign powers. It goes without saying that we in Germany should first of all let it come to a showdown with the Jews. Gehring admitted to making those statements. And he did not deny that in a letter dated July 31, 1941, shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union, he had charged Reinhard Heydrich with the complete solution of the Jewish question of the German sphere of influence in Europe. Some six months before Heydrich disclosed to high-ranking civil servants meeting in a villa at Bonze, Berlin, that the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe was to be, in fact, the annihilation of the Jewish race. The Einsatzgruppen followed the German armies as they advanced on the Eastern Front seizing Jews from their homes and taking them and other Nazi victims into the fields to be murdered. But as the war progressed, the Nazis found it necessary to find permanent installations to house, exploit for labor, and finally to murder these victims of Nazi insanity. Concentration camps already existed to imprison perceived enemies of the state. Now something more formidable was required extermination centers to eradicate the unwanted who had not been killed in the fields. The extermination camps were Treblinka, Sobibor, Meidenek, Shelmo, Belzec, and Auschwitz. And of them all, Auschwitz murdered the most. We had uh, largely completed our case when the electrifying word was received by me at Nuremberg that the British had captured Rudolf Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp. I asked that the British send Hirsch to me to Berlin, to Berlin, uh, to, to Nuremberg uh, so that I might uh, interrogate him, uh, and I did so over a period of three days. And uh, at the completion of that interrogation, I reduced his testimony to an affidavit. Uh, that affidavit uh, was, had called him to Berlin, where he told Hirsch that he was to convert Auschwitz, which Hirsch, of which Hirsch was the uh, commandant, into a facility for the destruction of Jews who, be, who would be sent there by Adolf Eichmann, the head of the Jewish section of the Gestapo, also my, my defendant. Himmler explained to Hirsch that if the Jews, Germans, did not destroy the Jews in the course of the war, Germany would be destroyed by the Jews. Hirsch actually believed this absurdity. He returned to Auschwitz, the thought of not complying with the draconian order never occurred to him. He built Auschwitz into the foremost extermination plant in history, in which, as I say, he told me, two and a half million human beings had been exterminated. How was this done? How was this done? Picture this tragedy of murder by the man. A train pulls into the siding at Birkenau, the primary Auschwitz extermination center, an engine and 30 cattle cars jammed with Jews. It is met by SS officers and guard dogs. The doors are opened and exhausted men, women, and children stumble out. They are told to leave their belongings behind. Able-bodied men and women without small children are directed to line up to the right all others, women and children, aged and infirm, stand to the left. The latter are to be taken directly as they are informed uh, to the showers. When they arrive at the assigned building and enter, they are told to remove shoes and clothing, carefully hanging the latter on numbered pegs. 
The door to the communal shower room opens. Apprehensively, they enter, mothers holding their children's hands. For a moment, they are frightened, but are reassured when they observe the shower heads and the seating of the room, and men of the Sonder Commando who accompany them. The latter soon leave, however, sealing the door behind them. Fear returns. In a moment, the shower heads activate. They reach out for the water, only to realize to their horror that gas is spewing out. They scream and try to rush to the barred door. Children cry out and fall to the ground to be trapped by their gasping mothers. After a few minutes, the room is a macabre assembly of dead and dying victims, faces distorted in pain, the eyes of little children frozen in fright. Screams of terror give way to the silence of death. They pull out the bodies and trudge them to the elevators, which the sonar commandos, which take them to the furnaces above where gold rings are removed and gold teeth pulled out. Corpses are burned in the furnaces and ashes scattered upon the ground or dumped in a stream to be carried to the sea. This was not the crime of the soda commandos who were themselves Jewish and would take their turn in time in the gas chambers, nor a Rudolf Hirsch alone, follower of the orders of Himmler and the policy of Hitler, but of 20th century man under whose rule of the world this incredible crime was committed. How many innocents died at Auschwitz? Was it four million or three million or two? Does it matter? A mother weeps equally for the loss of each child as we weep for the Auschwitz victims of the Hitler Holocaust. On the first day of October 1946, the eight judges constituting the Nuremberg Tribunal took their seats at the bench facing the prisoner's dock, which was empty. Before it, the defense counsel occupied their chairs. To the left were the prosecution tables occupied by the four allied prosecutors and the principal members of their staffs. I sat at the American table. Beside us, behind us, the visitors' gallery was packed with members of the press and visitors. The defendants were to be brought into the courtroom one at a time to hear the sentence pronounced against them. At 10 minutes before 3, the panel door in the back of the prisoner's dock slid silently open. The defendant, Hermann Goering, stepped out of the elevator which had brought him from the ground floor where the other defendants waited. Goering put on a set of headphones which had been handed to him by one of the white-helmeted American guards. The president of the tribunal began to speak. Goering signaled that he was unable to hear through the headphones and there was an awkward delay while the technician sought to correct the difficulty. A new set of headphones was produced, and once again, Garing quietly awaited the words which were to decide his fate. Defendant Herman Wilhelm Garing, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. The number two Nazi turned on his heel and passed through the panel door into the waiting elevator. The door closed, and there was a hum of whispered voices in the courtroom as those present awaited the arrival of the next defendant, Hess. Hess, who had flown his Messerschmitt to England in a futile effort to persuade the British to abandon the fight with Germany, was sentenced to imprisonment for life. The other defendants appeared in turn and received their sentences, 12, including Martin Bormann, who had been tried in absentia, and my defendant, Ernst Kaltenbrenner, received death sentences. Three were acquitted, and the remaining seven received varying terms of imprisonment. The tribunal declared as criminal organizations the leadership core of the Nazi party, the Gestapo, the SD, and the SS. I had been designated by Justice Jackson as his personal representative <coughs> at the executions of these convicted the Nazis and was present in the Palace of Justice on the fateful night of October 15, 16, 1946. Shortly before midnight, the electrifying word was released. 
that Goering had cheated the hangman by taking poison while lying ostensibly asleep upon the bed in his cell. Death thus came to Goering by his own hand as it had come to Hitler, Himmler, and Goebbels before him, even as the prison officer was walking to the cell block to give formal notice of the executions to take place that night. At 11 minutes past one o'clock in the morning of October 16, the white-faced former foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop stepped through the door into the execution chamber and faced the gallows on which he and the others condemned to die by the tribunal were to be hanged. His hands were unmanacled and bound behind him with a leather thong. Ribbentrop walked to the foot of the 13 steps leading to the gallows platform. He was asked to state his name and answered Joaquin von Ribbentrop. Flanked by two guards and followed by the chaplain, he slowly mounted the stairs. On the platform, he saw the hangman with a noose of 13 coils and the hangman's assistant with the black hood. He stood on the trap and his feet were bound with a webbed army belt. Asked to state any last words, he said, God protect Germany, God have mercy on my soul. My last wish is that German unity be maintained, that understanding between East and West be realized, and there be peace uh, for the world. The trap was sprung and Ribbentrop died at 129. In the same way, each of the remaining defendants approached the scaffold and met the fate of common criminals. After the execution, the body of each man was placed upon a simple wooden coffin, a tag with the name of the deceased was pinned to cold shirt or sweater. With the hangman's noose still about his neck, each hanged man was photographed. The body of Herman Gary was brought in upon, placed upon its box to be photographed with the others. In the early morning hours, two trucks carrying 11 caskets left the prison compound of the Palace of Justice bound for Dachau concentration camp near Munich. There, during all of that day, the bodies were burned, one after the other, in ovens which had been used for Dachau prisoners. It was reported that in the evening, the 11 urns containing the ashes were taken away to be emptied into the river Isar. The dust of the dead was carried along in the current of the stream to the Danube and thanks to the sea. The defendants who had received sentences of imprisonment were transferred to Potsdam Prison, which had been designed for some 600 prisoners, but was now reserved for the seven from Nuremberg. As the years passed, the defendants completed their terms and were released. The last prisoner was Rudolf Hess, who had been sentenced to life. On August 17, 1987, 41 years after the final judgment of the tribunal, Hess managed somehow to commit suicide. With his death, the Hitler tyranny ended. The tyrant and his chief cohorts were gone. They had sought to achieve greatness in history, but they inscribed their names in sand, and clean waters fell upon the beach and washed them out. They had intended to establish a new order for Europe, but they built upon pillars of hate, and what they stood for could not stand. Hitler and his confederates who led Germany to disaster in the 20th century are all dead. They were the principal actors in a fearsome drama, but as Prospero foretold, they were all spirits and melted into air, into thin air, the tyrant Hitler and his associates in crime will someday be forgotten. Forgotten, too, will be their crimes. It is enough that tomorrow's world remembers what today's world has learned through the bitter experience of this fallen regime, that tyranny leads to inhumanity and inhumanity to death. Nuremberg stands firmly against the resignation of man to evil leaders because of Nuremberg and the effort which it represents of man's attempt to elevate justice and law over inhumanity and war, there is hope of for a better tomorrow. We may enter the atomic age determined 
that tyranny shall not extend its way, nor war become its gain, placing our faith in the cause of justice, in the freedom of man, and in the mercy of God. Thank you. on C-SPAN 3 live this morning, uh, so others outside of here have seen it, um, and uh, we will have some of the papers published in the uh, International Lawyer. I wanted to thank Ingrid, Ingrid Busan and uh, Demetrius Eleutherio uh, and the other members of our planning group for putting this program together, and particularly our speakers for presenting us with something I think we will all not forget. Thank you. And I declare this <laughs> Give that speech.